Good evening. My name is Allison Ramsey, and I'm the interim president and CEO of Thomas Jefferson's Poplar Forest. It is my great pleasure to welcome you here tonight for Mr. Jefferson's salon series on race and democracy. We have an esteemed group of scholars with us here tonight and are looking forward to an enlightening conversation, which will begin in just a few minutes. Before we get started, I first want to thank the Academy Theater for the use of this beautiful and so lovingly restored space. Mr. Jefferson's salon series began at Poplar Forest in Jefferson's dining room in 2016. We are grateful for the use of this grand space so that we can broaden our audience and share these thought-provoking conversations and ideas with greater numbers of individuals. We have addressed a variety of topics through Mr. Jefferson's salon series over the past few years. Black resistance and Black Lives Matter, religious freedom, fake news, monuments, civility, and many more. We are hopeful that you will keep up with us online at poplarforest.org to see upcoming salon discussions and events planned for this fall as well as into next year. And of course, we hope that you will come visit us soon. I would also like to thank our sponsors for tonight's event, American Evolution, the Greater Lynchburg Community Foundation, the City of Lynchburg, Progress Printing, and the News in Advance. It is now my great honor to introduce our distinguished moderator and, moderator, excuse me, and welcome um, Dr. Edward L. Ayers to the stage. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Thank you. That's really exciting. This is a remarkable lineup of people. And so I decided that uh, using my enormous power as moderator, I would ask everyone to introduce themselves a little bit. I'm going to ask them to come out right now as a group. And uh, we've decided collectively to arrange the chairs in a more semicircular fashion. So I asked my friends to come out and do the uh, coordinated dance of moving their chairs. Thank you. And I don't want to hear any jokes, how many PhDs does it take to move chairs? Well, we'll, we'll, get, we'll find out here, you know. So, and, and water, look at this, how, many, how multifaceted a maneuver that was. So, um, Talent. have something to talk about. Beautiful. So, I'll begin by introducing myself. So, uh, I'm Ed Ayers, uh, I was uh, president of the University of Richmond, before that I was at the University of Virginia for a long time. And so this issue of democracy and race, if you've lived in Virginia, you know that it's uh, close to the surface of things that, uh, has been in part of our history and a part of our present as we try to, to navigate um, our way forward. So I, I've written some books about uh, the American Civil War and about the birth of segregation and disfranchisement. Um, my job tonight is to try to facilitate the conversation among these really uh, brilliant colleagues. So if we could move down the line and tell about yourself, that would be great. Oh, uh, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Yeah. My name is Ibram Kendi. And I am interested in this topic because Thomas Jefferson is one of the more pivotal and critical figures in the history of racial thought uh, in America. And I've sort of written a, a history of racist ideas in particular, and I also write now on, on anti-racist ideas and, and what it means to be an anti-racist. Good evening. I'm Martha Jones. Um, I hail from Baltimore, Maryland, and uh, I'm here because um, uh, I'm a historian of um, American democracy with a particular interest in the role that black Americans have played in the history of our democracy, which means um, I'm interested in sort of the ideals of democracy, but I'm also interested in the struggles and the the, the difficult places um, that we have been um, in our long um, history. So, thanks. Thanks, Martha. Hi, everyone. Um, <laughs> you're out there. We can't see we, we you. Can't we can't really see you. We yeah. 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 So keep the noise up. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we're glad you're there. Otherwise, we just got to talk to each other. Uh, I'm David Blight. I teach at Yale University. I've um, written about historical memory, particularly about the Civil War. And uh, I've written a biography of Frederick Douglass. I've always taught about um, race as a, a sort of central thread, central problem, central story uh, in American history. 
My name is Peter Onuf. I spent too much of my life thinking about Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> I used to teach in Charlottesville. No longer. I'm retired, and as I like to say, uh, I'm a nearly dead white guy. <laughs> and to get serious for a minute, I've always been deeply conflicted about Jefferson, so I'm looking for some therapy tonight. <laughs> so as you can see, we've got an interesting group and um, people deeply knowledgeable about these topics that we're talking about. We'll talk for uh, 45 or 50 minutes among ourselves and then we'll be looking for stimulating questions from you. And we know you're there because I've heard you laugh at Peter's bad <laughs> joke. So I, I know that, that you're there. So uh, don't hesitate at any point. So I suggested to my friends that we anchor our questions uh, in the place where we are. Uh, honoring um, the kind invitation of Papa for us to have us here, but also thinking about Virginia, thinking about Lynchburg. So th those will be sort of the theme of the, of the few questions I plan to ask. And the first one is, everyone knows that the author of the Declaration of Independence was himself quite dependent on enslaved people, both at Monticello and here at Poplar Forest. People have debated whether that fact was a paradox, an accident, or were they more deeply related to each other? So I'm curious how my friends think we might think about that, that relationship between the author of democracy and a man who was also a slaveholder throughout his life. Who'd like to start? Well, Ed, if you're gonna think outside the box, if you're gonna be a visionary, you have to overlook a lot to see far. And I think Jefferson fits that bill what was central to his life was his understanding of himself and his family, of the world that he created for himself at Monticello in Poplar Forest. And there was no question to him that that was a good place. He was in a good place. When he thought of the future, he thought of himself and of the idea of universal rights and natural rights eventually emerging worldwide. But there's no paradox here. In fact, I would say being a slave owner enabled Jefferson to imagine democracy because the first meaning of equality for revolutionaries in the run-up to the revolution was the equality of Anglo-Americans in the British imperial world. That equality was aspirational for Jefferson, and the notion that you could transcend national boundaries in a republic of letters, that you could earn respect for your merits and your skills, that was what inspired him. What happened was the mobilization of patriot sentiment against the British meant that Jefferson had to look down to the larger white community Mobilization, that's where democracy came from. And I think the big question we have to face right now is what is democracy? And I don't think we could give you, despite the fact that this is a, a brilliant panel, as you indicated. <laughs> I don't think we'll we see, we're only 30 question. seconds into it. I, I just want to say this, though, that democracy is a process, it's a dynamic thing, it's a mobilization. This was the mobilization that he could imagine. It had implications beyond his moment. He understood that. He knew the institution of slavery was unjust. But here's what I'd like to lay on you, and I'd like to hear from my friends and colleagues. I think the ideas, central ideas coming out of the enlightenment of race, of nationhood, of what a people is, all are bound up with each other. All of them have both enabling empowering implications and exclusionary implications. The idea of the people, that I think is central to the revolution. The invention of a people in a meaningful modern sense of the word comes out of the revolutionary era. And it is the technology, it's the medium through which uh, we have sought improvement, enlightenment to empower ourselves. Yet at the same time, that technology of popular political mobilization can be one of exclusion. And specifically in the, in the American Revolution, that technology 
is shaped by the geopolitical realities of making war. War is central to our story. We should never forget it. And in the context of war, democracy means both the empowerment of the white nation and its control over the enslaved people who people like Jefferson recognize as a potential internal enemy. That's the dynamic that is American history. That is, democracy is born with an idea of the people and an idea of another people. These peoples are at war, and it's transcending that war. It's achieving a just, just peace, which is the challenge. You can't go back to a golden age when democracy was real in America. Democracy's never been real. But you can go back to that moment and get an idea of who the people thought they were then and who are we now. How do we get that idea of the people and include everybody in it? I'm going to jump in because um, I think that the glue that holds this together for me um, is the word we haven't yet used, um, it, it's racism. And um, among the things that I ascribe to Jefferson and his generation um, are the seeds of that movement that will really coalesce in the 19th century, the movement we call colonization. So here, this notion that um, we have an emerging, emerging republic, an emerging democracy, um, a white man's yeah. republic um, requires a school of thought that will, if you will, remedy um, the problem that is um, slavery is already um, beginning to be undone, right, in law, in practice. Um, and now formerly enslaved people, free African Americans, are asking their own versions of the kinds of questions that Jefferson asked, are pressing right, on the new nation to belong. And I'm curious how you all sort of tell the story of colonization. To me, it's sort of this curious anti-slavery movement, right? It, slavery might end in a matter of years or decades or I think in Jefferson's view, it was perhaps a century. It could um, be forever. Forever. <laughs> but, it, but it would end, yes. right? And, it, it, there, it, and the question was, um, what then to do about the free African Americans um, in Jefferson's midst, midst? And colonizationists will, by the early 19th century, organize and raise funds, outfit ships, found Liberia and Maryland and Liberia and commit themselves to preserving a white man's republic even in the face of slavery's demise. And that to me is the, um, the glue um, because it is that anti-black racism that Professor Kendi has so um, importantly taught us to be always attentive to um, that helps me see what's consistent in that story that you told, rather than to see it as a contradiction? Um, well, this is great, by the way. This is fun. <laughs> <laughs> this is what we do for fun. I yeah. mean, <laughs> stick around. <laughs> um, it, it's always seemed to me, and I think I teach it this way, and by the way, I, pointing to colonization is a terrific idea here because it became a vision of removal and separation. It was a vision that, for the colonizationists, that America could really not have a future that was truly multi-ethnic, multiracial, biracial, whatever. It was removal. Um, but back to, the, to Jefferson and the founding, it's always seemed to me that it's both a great blessing and a curse that America, get, the United States, gets founded with these creeds. Jefferson's first principles of the Declaration. We're born with creeds. And like most creeds, we don't live up to them. We sin. <laughs> um, Frederick Douglass often said over and over and over, 
uh, he, he said America is a tangle of contradictions. At one point he even said America is its contradictions. We are our contradictions. If you have creeds, especially high creeds, you're going to violate them. And th th the reason I point that out is because Americans are always kind of surprised at our own hypocrisy. <laughs> it's like, well, why would, why would we be that hypocritical? Or why, you know, why doesn't the arc of history always bend toward justice? I mean, maybe it, who knows if it does. Some, some decades it feels like it does, and some decades it doesn't. You're looking for another arc, are you? I'm, I'm waiting for the next arc, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, you know, we're, we're, we, we are surprised by our hypocrisy, but we shouldn't be. Slavery is deeply entangled in the creation of a society in North America, uh, developing societies. It's deeply uh, embedded in virtually every civilization in history. Um, in fact, the, the term paradox, which we're kind of shoving aside here, I mean, it does, it most famously goes back to Ed Morgan, the great historian who wrote famously about this concept. But he didn't just say it was, you know, a piece of hypocrisy. He said, well, it's a paradox, but it can be explained because these, these slaveholders at the time of this revolution, these Republican slaveholders, they also had to have a dependent poor labor force. They knew that as much as they knew anything. And they had learned that a dependent poor racial labor force was more useful and longer lasting than anything else. It's just deeply embedded in the assumptions of the world they lived in and the world they were creating. And sometimes we just have to admit that. We are our contradictions. They're terrible contradictions. We should never accept them. We should always fight back against them. Uh, but there it is. You know, we, we want an American, we always want an American founding that is the beginning of perfecting something. And, uh, you know, a more perfect union comes out of the Constitution, but it's a great dream, but, uh, you know, it's still a bunch of human beings practicing human nature. Uh, we were blessed and cursed by Jefferson's Creed. Oh, yeah, man, I know that offends yeah. you, but... Uh, no, 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 I... I <laughs> and, you know, I can... I think... I think another thing that I've been trying to sort of figure out uh, was, and I think this goes to sort of the potential contradiction of how can a slave owner uh, lead a revolution for freedom? And so how does that sort of work? And, and to me, I think part of it has to do with how Jefferson and others like him imagined freedom. And, um, and I think the way in which they understood freedom was, I think, different than the way people who were enslaved um, or even white indentured servants understood freedom. And, and I think for Jefferson and other slaveholders and even other merchants who may not even been slaveholders, they understood, they felt that they were not free to dictate the policies that determine the American economy. They felt they were not free to determine the political apparatus um, you know, of the colonies. So fundamentally, they did not feel like they had power. So, so for them, it seemed as if power came before freedom. And so they essentially were seeking to clamor power from England to be able to set the political economy of what became the new United States so they could be free. And, and I think that's an interesting sort of and I think it's a powerful, right. maybe not powerful, it's probably not the best no, word. No, I like but, it, I like it. You know, I, I think it's, it's important for us to sort of understand, and I think that's indicative historically of extremely powerful people. In other words, they gain freedom through power, right? While enslaved people were just seeking for the ability to not necessarily determine political economy, 
but be able to sort of determine when they're going to eat, when they're going to sleep, and what they're going to do. And so it's a completely yeah. sort of different set of sensibilities. But I think that's how they can understand they, that they were sort of seeking freedom. I think that's right. I'd like to build on that. I think that's exactly right. I think, as I was saying, we need to start our story with war, with conflict, with power, with a conflict over who will have power. And that's precisely the moment in which people like Jefferson become aware that enslaved people constitute a security threat. Mm -hmm. That is, they could exercise power under the right geopolitical circumstances. That is, there's a revolution, there are invading British armies, there's a chance here for enslaved people to rise up as a nation spontaneously to mobilize against the mobilizers. So we're talking about a double mobilization or a triple mobilization. It's in this moment of regime change and a quest for power that the whole question emerges of who is who and what are the boundaries of these communities. And I'm not making an argument for Jefferson and nobody ever thinks I'm a Jefferson apologist, but he does say in 1814, and this you could consider progress, when he's writing to Edward Coles, his uh, neighbor, he says, before the revolution we thought of our slaves as domestic animals like livestock. Now he knows they can communicate, they're human, he may have his ideas about their capacities, but they're human, but they're like livestock. The revolutionary situation makes him aware that they could become a people, and if the world were a just one, if there were a just God, the wheel of fortune would turn, and black would be over white, a striking thing for Jefferson to say, and he says it because it really could have happened. And that's the point. It really did happen. Yeah, it's the first emancipation. Well, it happens in it happens in Saint Domingue. It yeah. happens yeah, in absolutely. the French Caribbean, and I think yeah. um, Jefferson is not the only person of his generation to study that revolution um, and to marvel at it and be terrified. Right? Terrified, and, and terrified, yes. right? By um, what it suggests is possible um, in their own world. But that might be a kind of, I don't. Progress is a problematic word to use in this case, but that recognition, a kind of recognition of the potential power of a people. Now, his answer is not our answer. What do you do about it? His answer is to impose a peace through separation to keep the nations apart. But the war itself is the thing I think we need to focus on because it's the conflict and it's the sustained struggle Mm -hmm. And that's a long arc, a couple of centuries of sustained struggle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you sometimes hear people talk about uh, timeless ideals and so forth. My takeaway from all that you're saying is that there's nothing timeless about any of this. It was all very situated Absolutely. in time. And you could watch mm -hmm. in the course of the war, in the course mm -hmm. of the you know, uh, 10,000 uh, African Americans m making themselves three by joining the British cause and so forth, uh, is that this is all uh, in flux at every step along the way. So, as we know, uh, I think Jefferson would have been surprised to imagine what Lynchburg would have been by the time of the American Civil War, only, what, 35 years after his death or so, um, that Lynchburg was a place where we might have imagined the future of slavery had there not been emancipation, industrialization, using enslaved labor, uh, taking advantage of the, the power of the river and shipping and so forth. Um, and and slavery and this extra, you know, lease on life because of the cotton economy and the domestic slave trade that, in which Virginia plays such a, a leading role. But the same paradox of, or not paradox, we've, it was not a paradox, just in case you thought from my earlier question that it was, as you heard about it. But there is a connection. Virginia's white leaders then secede from the United States that had been created not long before, the documents hammered out by these white Virginians, under the name of democracy. But the people in slavery, the half million, the largest of any state in the Union, living in Virginia, immediately act upon a different idea of freedom. In some ways, it's picking up what you were saying from the very beginning. There's these coexisting, powerful ideas of freedom going along the way. 
I'm wondering how we still struggle how to explain the American Civil War. Um, and you know, what does it mean in terms of democracy? Um, so I, I, since we've not been able to figure it out in decades, I'd like for all of you to figure it out in the next <laughs> six minutes. Who would like to begin? No problem. <laughs> you know, there's a, there's a scene, uh, if you'll permit me to just take us a bit sure. uh, east of here to Norfolk. Um, it's 1863, January 1st. Um, Lincoln has issued the Emancipation Proclamation, um, and Norfolk is exempt. That doesn't stop tens of thousands of enslaved people and free people from taking to the streets and, I think, enacting um, a, a, a deep expression of what democracy might be, which is to say, um, formal law may not have reached us yet, right? But we see, right? We not only see what's on the horizon, but we're prepared to take that into our own hands. And the descriptions of that celebration are breathtaking um, because it is joyous, it is public, it is open, it is notorious. Um, and these are indeed the folks who are going to become um, the engines of that era that we call Reconstruction, who are going to be right, the hundreds and thousands of black leaders and activists and office holders who are going to expose the lies right, or test that sort of assertion, that gentle assertion that Jefferson makes. They might be human beings. Well, it turns out um, they're far more than that. right? They are ready members of a rapidly transforming body politic. Um, and I think that kind of scene for me is um, essential for understanding that confrontation, that people have been liberated, um, self-liberated, even before they will be formally free. Right. And even before the war, uh, in election years, especially 1856, 58, and 60, in pockets of the South, they have what were called insurrection scares, especially around election times. It was clear to lots, lots of people in the enslaved population that, that things were in trouble in this country, that, that, that the people were fussing and fighting about the future of them, the future of slavery. Texas had a whole wave of these. It's all over Texas newspapers. Insurrection scares in 1856 and 1860. Uh, f fear that uh, if, if they keep talking, in fact, they even, they even had resolutions passed in some places to not let your slaves come near political meetings mm -hmm. because these political meetings are, are pretty intense. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the, 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 this is happening even before you get a war. But, but back to your point about war, and since Ed, you brought us to the Civil War, again, nothing is inevitable or destined about all of this. Uh, although we Americans have a hard time accepting that too. We want to believe we're on some, you know, some escalator upward. Um, great changes about race, when they've come, uh, have come out of disorder, war especially, but also great social disorder without formalized, think of the civil rights movement didn't come out of people sitting down and deciding to have a nice referendum. Um, great changes came out of the 1930s to a degree because it was a terrible Great Depression. Um, great changes in law. The, the, the fundamental Supreme Court cases we might point to on the positive side of improvement for race in America have come out of times of great disorder and conflict. Now that's, you know, it's not an argument for let's go have some more conflict so we can have some more change. On the other hand, maybe it is. Uh, <laughs> that's you know, not I, what I heard between the lines there. <laughs> well, I always tell my students, you know, you're yearning for a political realignment. Everyone's always yearning for a political realignment or something. I always tell them you have two choices. Civil War or Great Depression. That's where we had our two big, you know, which one would you like, you know? Which, which would you sign up for? Uh, mm -hmm. But that's, I'm afraid that's what history kind of tells us. Um, 
And the Civil War is the biggest of all. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big revolution. Uh, it's a big, terrible, bloody, horrible event. Uh, and, and it's not to put any, any nice veneer on it. But out of it comes a fundamental remaking of the United States. Now, even that remaking didn't last very well. No. Um, and, and I guess the, the, just a final point, uh, de this democracy thing, it, it tends to work where it works when people have faith in their institutions. Well, when the institutions of democracy, usually meaning government, but that might even mean the media, uh, might even mean, you know, other kinds of institutions are functioning and people have trust in them and so on. When people cease to trust or believe in institutions, democracy is in big trouble. Yeah, uh, I think to, to add to David's point about the sort of resistance among enslaved people in the 1850s, which began to get more and more intense, uh, just as you also had working class and, and poor non-slave holding whites in right. the South, in, in places like Virginia and all over, um, also beginning to resist what became known as the slave power among abolitionists. And so if you're a few thousand extremely wealthy slave holding families and you have five million, potentially five million poor non-slaveholding whites and four million um, enslaved black people who, in which you can recognize the growing amount of resistance, at the <laughs> same time, you're seeing, you're looking at the federal government and you're seeing more and more open abolitionists sitting in Senate seats and, and in House of Representatives and, and pushing against slavery. And so you're imagining that the power of the federal government is slipping away from you. Right. And so how can you essentially maintain your security without the power of the federal government? And, and so in many ways, even a state like Virginia, who, as you stated, was, was seeking a more industrial sort of line of, 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 of slave labor, you still needed to keep those people in line. You still needed to keep those people enslaved. You still needed to basically be able to live. And, and so that's why, as you know, in certain states, you know, people would evoke the word Haiti <laughs> to sort of push people to join the succession movement. Because again, again, it was about maintaining security. And what was ironic is, so, so and then they made the case that it wasn't Act, it was really about democracy, right? Exactly. right? So then, of course, you, you're not going to make the case, you know, even in today's political scene, we don't, you know, political leaders aren't saying exactly why they're doing something, but what, what's, we, we know what's driving them, and then we know what they're going to justify it as. And what was ironic is the type of democracy that Confederate leaders put forth was they considered very similar to the type of democracy Thomas Jefferson envisioned for America, and that America was slipping away from this sort of republic of rich white men. It's a restoration in some ways, right? Precisely. Yeah. And, and obviously, you know, enslaved people had a different sense of democracy. And what was interesting also is when, when emancipation came, or I should say people started talking about emancipation, and, and there was also discussion among enslaved people and political leaders of what would come next. And enslaved people started saying, you know what, in order to be free, we need land. So what was ironic is earlier it was, it, so the, their sense of what they needed to be free changed, particularly once the shackles were about to be removed or, or removed. In, in other words, you can't essentially call me free in an agricultural society and not give me access to land and basically say that I need to now work for the very people who enslaved me. And so that was then, for them, they considered a democracy to be a place where people are free and have access to land. And could vote. Precisely. Right, right. Yeah. right. And I think there's something we need to keep in mind, and that is, uh, to pick up on your theme, Ibrahim, of, the, of power <clears throat> is civic capacity. Yeah. There has to be a state there 
And uh, in some ways, we think a moment has come like emancipation. And, oh, that's, that's done. It'll take care of itself. The follow-through that you're talking mm -hmm. about, the, the political economy, access to land, uh, the rights, the standing in courts of law. Uh, another uh, pseudo-Jeffersonian legacy is a uh, small government or no government. The antebellum American South was a big state part of the world. Yeah. There was a lot of organized power that sustained that system and it was working pretty well, the technology of control, of using the law and of uh, manipulating uh, the aspirations of, uh, of poor whites, of providing new opportunities. It's the way we worry about home ownership. They worried about slave ownership. The price of slaves is getting too high. But it was still profitable. Was yeah, that's profitable. a problem. Uh, so, but, the, but they're going to take creative solutions like reopening the slave trade. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's the combination of redefining the people that is, those people who are rights claimers, who are citizens, who have standing, and having then the coercive apparatus to sustain what you could sustain in war. War is a form of organization when you have a society highly mobilized and organized. You, needed to ha you need to have the machinery of the state operational in the post-war South. Well, the Confederacy only lived in war. That's something that we tend to yeah. forget. It was, it was a war yeah. device. And I, so I when it's gone, democracy right. is undermined as well. I, I think um, at this juncture, I hope some of you are, are wondering about American women. <laughs> <laughs> The first applause <laughs> Because what we know about this very same moment is that um, it is precisely in this moment that um, the aspiration, the quest, the demand um, for women's political empowerment, mm -hmm. black and white, will um, take hold and really never leave um, the main stage of the American body politic again, that these debates, which um, I thought Peter said war one more time, you know, it is a powerful claim for African-American men who have served in the Union Army, right? right? This then is their ticket, their assurance, right? Their way into the body politic, seemingly, or at least arguably, an irrefutable claim. Right. Um, but black women are without that claim in this moment but the seed has been planted and has been planted firmly, deeply, and irrevocably. Um, and so we are in the midst of many debates about democracy um, and who is a member of the body politic and by what terms. Um, and that is a story, of course, that will take us all the way into the 20th century. So forgive me. And that's me. where we're going, Peter. There you go. Do you mind, Dave, if I go ahead? Well, I'm, I'm going to get moderate. one dig in on All succession. right, go ahead. <laughs> Well, to, to pick up on Martha, your most recent book and Stephanie McCurry's most recent book, not that we have to name books here, but... Just sell them. Yeah, just sell them. Just joking. Um, <laughs> well, has shown us that this, this thing called democracy, you can practice politics and democracy even if you don't have the right to vote. But we associate democracy so much with the suffrage and not without reason. But so much great scholarship has now been done on different kinds of politics, politics on the ground, politics that women, southern women, could practice during the Civil War uh, uh, to affect the fate of the war. I mean, if it, back to Drew Faust on that. But just one last quick point. One of the things secession should always teach us, I mean, there it sits, the one great example we have of it, is that this, this thing, sovereignty, part of democracy, republicanism, whatever word we want to use, it can also be put to very conservative ends. We tend Absolutely. to think of democracy as that which maximizes rights, or, and, and for good reason. We, we wanted to do that. But, but the Confederacy, believing in its own sovereignty, believing it was, it was simply reenacting the American Revolution, uh, believing that, is a is a is the creation of a slaveholders republic, mm -hmm. uh, and should they have, if they had succeeded if they had won the war in some version of their victory, 
uh, they would have claimed forever that what they had done was a great democratic revolution. Yeah, their symbol is George Washington, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So you talked about this arc earlier, David, and you know, Martha's reminding us of the great struggles for women's suffrage in the late 19th or the 20th century, but Virginia, unfortunately, the arc collapses uh, after the disfranchisement constitution of 1901, 1902. By the 19-teens, one, only one in five of the eligible voters in Virginia votes. One of the lowest voter turnouts in the United States. All black people fundamentally disfranchised and large numbers of poor white people. So if we believe there's an arc from Jefferson, and it's hard to imagine, that's only a hundred years, right, from Jefferson's death until Virginia is moderated by a man who is carefully overseeing all birth records to make sure there's no racial mixing. In some ways, Virginia has the most rigorous system of segregation all the way down to what people imagine to be blood. Somehow, you know, this striving toward democracy that we've seen, to what extent is it smothered in Virginia and the rest of the South in the early 20th century? And how do we account for its... It, it, so I'll, I'll just leave with that. You know, it, on the surface, it looks as if democracy has been denied in Virginia for decades. Um, and Virginia is known as a place where democracy is the democracy of relatively few rich white men and not for everybody else. So as we try to think about how these great arcs of American history intersect with those of Virginia, I'd be curious your thoughts about that. Well, I think, I think one of the ways I've tried to understand America's racial history um, has, has not just for us to sort of see and examine and recognize what people call racial progress, which doesn't necessarily fit this era. No. <laughs> right? But for us also to recognize racist progress, that, that racist policies have become more sophisticated over time. Yeah. Racist ideas justifying those policies have become more sophisticated over time. And so in the case of this era in, in Virginia, where you had, as you stated, very few, if any, black people were able to vote, and very few, even white people were able to vote. White, Amer white Virginians were taught, as black people were taught in their schools, that this was the heyday of democracy, that that these political leaders who were advancing these voter suppression techniques and, and the Ku Klux Klan and other paramilitary organizations that were supporting them through violence had redeemed the South, had, had redeemed the Confederacy, had brought progress <laughs> to, to the South because no longer are these corrupt black people voting and running for office and harming white people. It had just so happened, what was ironic, it was the flip side, right? That, that after the Civil War, you had black people and white people in this state and other southern states who were disenfranchised largely, obviously during the Confederate era and even previously, who were, who were able to shape a new Virginia, a new Virginia that was not dominated and dictated by wealthy, rich, white elites. And that was considered to be a horror show. Yeah. The readjuster, and, yeah. And that needed to be redeemed. And, and, and it essentially what, what needed to be redeemed was the Confederacy just without the flags, but of course the statues, right? And, and, and so, y'all know what I'm talking about, right? So, <laughs> and, 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 you know, the Confederacy just... They have a few here. <laughs> just so we can make sure, you know, we're clear, because we've been talking quite a bit of, in the United States about the Confederacy and... And, and whether the Confederacy is, and the Confederate monuments are sort of monuments to sort of Southern pride. And, and one of the interesting things I think, I don't know if you've gleaned from our discussion, is that during the Civil War, we don't actually know for sure whether the majority of Southerners even supported the Confederacy. That you can probably make a case, well, first of all, half of the South was pretty much black and enslaved, <laughs> almost. And so, of course, they didn't support the Confederacy. Yep. And then when you talk about the white South, you had so many people who did not want to go to war when they saw people who were slave-owning were exempt. 
You, you had so many people who, when they went and were drafted into the Confederate Army, were fleeing the Confederate Army, and were entering what was known as an Underground Railroad. You had white wives back home who were riding because there was no food during the Civil War. And so we actually don't know if the majority of Southerners, even white Southerners, supported the Confederacy, and you could probably make a case that they did not. And, and so that's so ironic because, and then when you top that off with what the Confederate leaders actually said, you know, Jefferson Davis saying that the inequality between the black and white races was stamped from the beginning, mm. who was the president of the Confederacy, and then the vice president of the Confederacy, Alexander Stevens, saying that this government is based on the great truth that the Negro is not equal to the white man and slavery subordination to the superior race is his natural and normal condition. Like that's the Confederacy. And, 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 and so I think that those people who quote redeemed the South were essentially trying to remake a nation, a, a state based on those racist policies and ideas. And in this period try to imagine a Confederacy that never existed but they put it in mm. marble. Yes. Yeah. What else we got? I guess <laughs> for me, um, I think I, I'll pick up on uh, David's gesture about what is politics. I'll take your statistics about African-American voting as the, the lay of the land Roughly, in the yeah. early 20th century. <laughs> Um, but I know you know well, in a city like Richmond, a woman like Maggie Lena Walker um, is um, an organizer. Never gave up for a day. Institution builder, that yep. black Americans um, are um, not, because they are excluded from the polls, um, they've not folded up, right? They are building institutions. HBCUs in this state, right, who continue to educate young people, right, and build a kind of mighty army, right, that will be um, essential to the civil rights revolution. Um, so I think about black civil rights organizations, um, women's clubs, entrepreneurs, banks, um, churches, and all of that, right, is black politics. Um, it always has been, right, from coming back to the earliest decades of the Republic when black Americans are excluded from the polls and in a new era of disfranchisement or voter suppression, um, black politics continues. And not unlike enslaved people, right? Watches and waits and organizes and plans and readies itself. Right? That's how you can have reconstruction. So full, in many ways, the most fully realized vision of democracy we have in this country, right? And then again, the civil rights movement. Just, so it's, it appears to be quiescent, but that, that democratic ferment is there all along. I, I mean, I think it's, I think it's running. Oh, right? yes, I'm it, saying. It's, it's running it, all along. Exactly. Iram talks about uh, the evolution or progress of racist ideas, and I think it pr prompts in me the reflection that for everything that the revolutionary founders got wrong, and that we're trying to work through, they did have one profound insight, and that had to do with why you needed a vigilant and active citizenry. Mm -hmm. And that is, if we're not all on ready alert, you might say, for a possible state of war, then we're gonna have the emergence of what they would call in different forms, aristocracy. Yeah. That is, mm -hmm. a democracy or a republic actually opens up opportunities for new forms of oligarchical power. And one of the things that was most moving about your statement, Ed, was uh, we have the triumph of a, of, of a white Virginia, which ultimately white Virginians, if they're not in this ruling elite, are suffering, not as much as their, their black brothers and sisters. Uh, but this is the fate of all regimes in which power is concentrated. And one of the problems with our democracy is that we are blinded to the many ways in which power can be concentrated. And it takes these forms of racial power, white supremacy, the new sorts of oligarchy and dynastic wealth that we have now proliferating in this country. It's not 
just the situation of enslaved people and their descendants. We're all in this together. And one of the great things that freedom fighters, black and white, have done for us is to keep us alert to the danger of new forms of oligarchy. And frankly, as a, an old guy who doesn't have much more time on this planet, I'm really worried about the capacity we have for democracy in a, a world of surveillance, of concentrated wealth, of what is consent in the future, given the way we understand the monetization of the data bits, this is for you, Ed, that constitute, <laughs> that constitute uh, 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 the emergent forms of modern life. Uh, history is a good thing to reflect on so that we can be alert to the new shapes that power can take. So I will say that we're getting ready to pivot to you and the microphone and ask provocative questions. I see my friend David had his finger raised, which I take to be a universal symbol of he has something to say. <laughs> but I will also say that I hope that you're gathering yourself to ask the next question. We, we can talk indefinitely, but we prefer to answer questions or comments that you have. So be mobilizing yourself uh, to take the mic. David. Oh, thank you. Well, uh, before we dive into the present, which is probably where the Q&A will go. <laughs> Don't know. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to say one quick thing about... There's no rush. Is that? There's no rush. I was just oh, alerting good, you to be good, ready. Good, yeah, yeah right. that's right. Um, on the Jim Crow era here, which yeah. you asked about, there is a tendency, again, to see that long period through its laws, and not without good reason, and its court cases, and so on. But it was also a system of control like apartheid was in South Africa. It was a system of social humiliation and, and, and a system that worked in way in so many subtle ways uh, apart from the law. Th that's one of the things we need to remember about that era. And your, your book, uh, The Promise of the New South, has uh, so much of this in it. This is an era of the late 19th, early 20th century with vast changes going on, economic, social changes, immigration, cities uh, growing out of control. Americans are frightened by the very thing they're creating. It's out of order. You know, it's that old book called The Rage for Order. Uh, there was a rage for order. And now you've got an, a new kind, uh, which you've written about, new kind of virulent, racial theory. White supremacy gets, if anything, much more sophisticated in the late 19th century. It gets science on its wagon. Not that it hadn't had it there before, but it really gets science on its wagon as never before. And it becomes a potent weapon of control. Yeah, eugenics has that deep exactly. history in Virginia exactly. as well. We contribute a lot of the ideas on that. You know, there's yeah. an excellent book about all. It's called about Virginia, called "Managing White Supremacy," oh, right? Yeah. And so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Virginia has the highest stage of yeah. carefully managed yeah. uh, segregation, and so it's interesting to think and disheartening uh, to think about the continuities from Jefferson's very kind of scientific uh, yes. vision as he imagines it scientific to what we do in the in 20th century Virginia. It's interesting to see how rapidly things change again, though. Uh, now Virginia, a blue state, uh, yeah. and all this ferment. So it's, you know, one thing history teaches is that what it, whatever it is is not going to be that way for long. Thank but, God. Yeah, you know, <laughs> that, there's that. that. That's right. So I still can't see if there's any, if, I can't see you. But is, oh, there we go. There go. Ooh. But I'm shocked because there's no one standing. Maybe you couldn't see the microphone either. But now, so here we go. Now we go. I see movement toward the microphone. Oh, this is we, intimidating. We shall begin. Oh. And <laughs> I, I give <laughs> precedence to the microphone on my right, whoever is ready to begin. All right. Look at this. This is rapid mobilization. <laughs> Good job. Good, Good evening. Students. Good evening. Uh, my name is James Watkins. I'm here representing Virginia Episcopal School. First, I'd like to say thank you for this discussion. Uh, it's been amazing. Um, first, <clears throat> um, I think that having these open forum discussions is the best way that we can go forth to educate ourselves um, about racism and the struggle between racism and democracy. Um, top, the, the, these topics are not easy to have amongst schools, especially at an independent school like ours. 
Uh, this is a two-part question. <clears throat> um, because we've all been either reminded or enlightened about the rich history of Central Virginia and its role in American history, what's the best way to go forth to explore um, these topics further uh, once we leave here a month, like as a school? And then if you're a young teenager in 2019 in America, what's your role in, um, in figuring out like racism and democracy for our future going forward and as a vision? We're suddenly quiet <laughs> after that. We'd like to take a swing at that. I'll talk about the first part, um, about taking advantage of being in central Virginia, since I, I tried to gesture toward that with the questions. I, I think, you know, sometimes the history of Virginia is, is hidden. You know, Virginia likes to imagine it's really the middle Atlantic now. You know, it's not really the South, you know. Uh, and a place like Lynchburg that's been the, has, the city and the industry. Um, and, in fact, is not really touched by the war until pretty late in the war. So it seems kind of immune. And then you got that Appomattox place just up the road, right? And I noticed the sign, Appomattox, as I was driving down today, where America reunited, or something like that is what it is. Um, and I think as we've been discussing tonight, that's a, a problematic concept, right? So I think it's always good to say, where are we? What happened exactly here? and work from that, you know. So uh, that's an obvious answer, but you know, there's nothing like having your kids see where history transpired. And fortunately, we have so much of around here, obviously Poplar Forest as well has done such a wonderful job of um, reinventing itself and, and imagining the history of all the people who live there. So get out of the classroom, get into the, into the, the neighborhood is what I would say. And now the hard question, somebody else is gonna answer. The teenager. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you, David. No, no, no. <laughs> no I, I, I'll say this. I, I must be the closest to a teen. No, no. <laughs> Not even remotely <laughs> true. Um, <laughs> She's getting all the best lines tonight. But I, I do. Uh, but I do. Um, but I do spend time with young people. I. I, I I've been last couple of years teaching at uh, Baltimore. We have a school for the performing arts. Um, and I've been working with young people sort of out of the kind of books we write, asking um, what kind of stories they want to tell. And there are two things for me that at least have been powerful out of that. And, but the first is um, along the lines of what Ed suggested. We do a lot of walking and talking. Right, and I, I spent the day today, it's my first time in Lynchburg, thank you all very much for the hospitality, um, but I walked and I had nobody to talk to, and there was a lot to see, and I had a lot of questions, and, um, but in Baltimore, um, I have more answers than questions, and, and we walk and talk in our neighborhoods, and we make our history visible um, in that way, but we start really in the, on the streets and in the alleys, Baltimore's lots of alleys, um, and, uh, and this is a way, right, of um, making a link between the present and the past for the young people I work with. Um, the other thing, and this is a school for the performing arts, is um, I give them a lot of rope to um, take our histories but not feel bound by them when it comes time to produce their own creative work. So whether it's poetry or spoken word, um, or it's prose, or it's uh, a theatrical vignette, um, the most um, moving work for me, and I think for them, has been when we give them license to, um, to imagine, to reinvent, to build off of what we do, rather than teaching them dates and, and names and Yuck. Um, All those you know, these kinds of rote things, right? Yeah. Um, and in that way, um, when they say to me, you know, why didn't they teach us this history? I can say, well, now it's your turn to teach, right? And, and, and that has been instructive for me as a, as a teacher. I spent seven years as a high school teacher decades ago <laughs> uh, in Flint, Michigan. And I still think the most important teaching I ever did uh, was taking kids from an industrial city, we used to say out east, mm -hmm. to historic sites of all kinds, taking them to history. 
When you're young, history is something that you probably won't connect with until it hits you. So take them, take them places, uh, to sites, to museums, and so forth. Or just give them assignments around racism, guns, and climate, in whatever order you want to go. <laughs> because there are so many kids are already there. You know, climate, it's their planet. Guns, they're getting killed. Racism, it's America's essential problem. You know, invest them in it. Um, and, you know, make them own it. Mm. That's, that's easy to that's say, all right. not always easy to do. So. Okay, I'm seeing the other questions, so... All right, go. Yeah, yeah, go, we go. Feel, that was excellent. We've got good lines here. Thank you. Yes, yes, sir. Thank you. Hi, yes, my name is Matthew Gillett, and I'm a sophomore at the University of Lynchburg. Last night, I had the opportunity at the university to attend a talk on a topic similar to this one, and one of the questions that was asked was, white academics might know the history of racism, but they don't know the experience of the legacy of racism. How do we address this in discussions such as this one? So if I understand, white historians can't understand the legacy of racism? Is that, is that the gist of the they question? They don't have to live it. Exactly. Right. Fair question? Uh, well, uh, I guess it's my turn to respond. Uh, I think if we don't have the capacity to understand the experiences of other peoples, other Americans, other peoples around the world, if we don't have a sense of our common humanity, we can't have a, a politics. We have no place to begin to talk about the things that trouble us. And I, I think that's the, the challenge is, and I'll pick up on Ibram's theme of fight, uh, fighting, uh, fighting racism, and that is, and his book about anti-racism. Uh, this is a struggle that we're all engaged in, and I think that the future is one that young people can make better, not by replicating the past. They have it within them to identify with each other. I and mean, one of the great things about the rising generations is a hypersensitivity to feelings, to that question of comfort. It's easy to, to, to mock it, to, to, uh, 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 to dismiss this hypersensitivity, but it's actually a great resource for identification. I think it's there. It can't be inert, it can't just be solipsistic and directed at yourself, how comfortable I am. We need to expose ourselves to things that ought to make us as human beings uncomfortable about our history and about our prospects because of the things that we have to overcome from our history. Uh, I do not accept the idea of a racial boundary. I'm not saying that the experience of white supremacy isn't uh, different for an African American of course, but I understand that, we understand that, and we have an idea of living together, and we can make that real. I would just add that I think a better way of slightly shifting that question, if you'd allow me, is to ask why don't more of us, <laughs> not all of us, but more of us, reach beyond our boundaries, beyond our culture, beyond our region, beyond the place we grew up, beyond nation, beyond whatever barrier or boundary or line we, we are supposed to stay in and study the people on the other side. Okay. If I could say really quickly, I, I think what's absolutely critical for the scholar or the historian, obviously, is to have a very keen understanding of the subject. And, and so whether that subject is a group of people, and, and, and I think that one of the things that happens is you have some white historians who study African Americans who recognize the ways in which they really need to sort of understand African American culture, and they do the work to understand what they don't know, while you have others who don't do that work, right? But you also have black scholars who assume because they're black, they're experts on black people. And that could be just as damaging as well. And so I think that's why for me, what's absolutely critical 
is for the person to be truly an expert, right? Not just assume they're an expert uh, because they're white and there's nothing to learn about black people or because they're black so they must be an expert on black people. Great, thanks. Yes, my name is Nathan, and I'm a chaplain at the University of Lynchburg, so that guy was my, one of my students, so Good. Um, proud, proud moments. Um, I'd like to address this to Dr. Kendi, if I could. Um, your, work has been, uh, your, your work has been incredibly impactful and, and uh, incredibly profound, um, and I haven't finished your newest book, so I feel like some of my question might be later in that. Um, but you talk about um, basically how uh, there are anti or there are racist sentiments in abolitionists, in segregationists, and that just as um, Brian Stevenson has said, you know, um, racism or slavery never ended; it evolved. Um, it seems like you have presented that uh, racist ideas have haven't gone away; they've evolved, um, and racist policy um, has evolved. I'm assuming that you could speak to. Um, how has racist policy also then evolved uh, into our current culture, whether that's mass incarceration or uh, other things like that? And then can you speak a little bit, because I haven't finished your book, um, <laughs> about your new book, uh, practically, like, how do we begin the anti-racist quest, um, not only as individuals, but policy as well? Okay, so since I want to get to other questions, I'll just answer the last question. Is sure. Okay. okay. Um, so I think the first step in, in, in beginning that anti-racist quest is for people, for us, to, not, to no longer be in denial. In other words, the heartbeat of racism itself has always been denial. And so what happens is when a person is charged with saying something that's racist or doing something that's racist or being something or being racist, the typical flippant response is what? I'm not racist no matter what they just said, right? And, and that is a mark of denial. Slaveholders, Jim Crow segregationists, uh, eugenicists, white nationalists today, everyone essentially classified themselves as not racist using different terms in different eras. And, and so the first step is for us to realize that there's really no such thing as a not racist, that they are racist and that they are anti-racist. And chances are, if we're classifying ourselves as not racist, then we're probably a racist in denial. And so we have to stop denying mm -hmm. that if you're born and raised in the United States, then chances are you're raised to be racist. And we have to accept that before we can begin our striving to be anti-racist. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Davis Clement, a postdoc at University of Virginia, and my question is for Professor Kendi as well. Um, but it kind of relates to Professor Onuf's first point about um, even when America is at its best, it's hypocritic, hypocritical. Um, before the recent eruption of more explicit white supremacy, um, it seemed like the, the focus of uh, race scholarship was on implicit forms of racism. So um, the, the critical race theoretical critique of Brown versus Boards of, of Education that relied on sort of the liberal ideals of equality and meritocracy and colorblindness um, were actually propping up a kind of white supremacy themselves. <laughs> and so now that we're dealing with both the implicit, which is enshrined in our legal system, um, and probably our language, um, and we're dealing with the explicit white supremacy that people are more familiar with. How are those two things, you know, feeding each other? Because it seems like some people would say the answer to the explicit white supremacists would be to say more colorblindness, more liberalism, um, more equality. But from a critical perspective, those things are actually protecting white supremacy? So, you know, I'll say very quickly that I actually have been pushing back against the implicit, explicit sort of framework. And, and I think what was actually happening was we were not conscious of 
racist ideas, and we were not conscious of racist policies. And, and I think that as we've gained, become more conscious <laughs> of racism through Black Lives Matter, through other sort of movements, people have began to see what they didn't see before. What also people would say is, well, you take one person who specifically says there's something wrong with black people, and you take another person who says something like, uh, not to pick on Baltimore, but <laughs> you know, Baltimore <laughs> is an infestation where no human being would want to live there. And so what, 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 what people would say is that the first comment is an explicit racist idea, and the second comment is an implicit racist idea. And, and that's because they're, they're determining implicit and explicit based on whether we're using racial language. And, and what I would argue is we should not essentially look for racial language to determine whether an idea is racist or even determine whether a policy is racist. If, if an idea is suggesting that a majority black city is basically overrun by animals, or if a, if, a, if a policy is basically leading to racial inequity, then we should see it very clearly as racist. Good yes. evening. Good evening. My name is Chris Glover. I'm a local educator. Um, and I was trying to, to narrow down my questions because I had so many. Um, so I narrowed it down to two provocative topics and had to pick one. Uh, the first one was centered on reparations, second was the role of religion, so I decided to go with reparations. The role of what, the second one? Religion. Role of religion. 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 Oh, good. Uh, so my question is, I like to focus on the historical legacy a lot, um, and I know all of you have worked in this area in connecting the history and the past to the present, uh, the racial memory and how it connects today through economic and political policies and how they structure how we experience our lives today and some of the gaps that exist. So my question is, um, particularly with some of the discussion on reparations reaching uh, more of a national forefront in political discussions and journalism. Uh, what are your thoughts on reparations as a whole or uh, in general economic ways to combat some of the inequalities and then maybe ways also to change like our larger social imagination around race? I'm glad you narrowed that down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you really sharpened that baby. <laughs> I'll just say this, I am thrilled that we are finally just discussing reparations as, well, where John Conyers' bill has been for decades, which is establish a serious federal commission. As much as you, we might not like these federal commissions, and they can get messy, let's have a messy commission. Let's have televised national roundtables. Uh, to, to discuss this in ways that are not just local and not just in our own little groups and not just emotional complaining, but out of which might come three big ideas, six big ideas, uh, that in some political context that we can't even imagine yet, <laughs> out there on the horizon, might lead to a serious learning about history, but then a serious confrontation confrontation with this idea of repair. I mean, and, and it's not a new thing. That's, that's all, that's the other thing I'd say. Reparate, it, it, many other countries have done it all over the world. Uh, the United States has done it. We did it with the Japanese internment. Uh, and there are other cases. It's not a brand new thing. It's not as impossible as we sometimes portray it. But we've got to think it through. So I'm glad now there's at least, there's, there's a bill that says we're going to create a commission. So I will point out that we have used up the time mm -hmm. prior to the reception that's going to be upstairs. It's my job to tell you about and then to deny you the right to go to it right now because uh, let's have two more questions and relatively efficient answers if we can. So, yes. I am so glad. My name is Laverne Smith. I'm a, a student, a doctoral student at the University of Birmingham in the UK. I'm so glad he uh, chose his reparations question, because mine is related to religion. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm dealing with colonial churches in my thesis, mm -hmm. and the, 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 the dynamic in colonial Virginia, okay? And I've noticed that, that the struggle for religious liberty in colonial Virginia has significant parallel elements 
with the civil rights movement of the 20th century. In both colonial Virginia and the Jim Crow era, the majority cultures worked to determine the boundaries around which the minority groups could exist. The minority groups in both eras used civil disorder as well as legal structures to make change. I wonder if racial or civil liberty, civil rights, will develop along the trajectory that religious liberty developed. Well, <laughs> I, I, I guess um, I want to say something. As a, you go a, a, first. A, I'm a teacher, so you'll forgive me because I'm going to sort of ask you a sure. question. Sure. Could you what, please not report on this and bring it tomorrow? That's what I would <laughs> um, no. Which is to say, um, I think the first sort of um, place I'd want to um, sort of rethink your thesis is um, to imagine that those are two separate questions, right? Um, and that I'm somebody who spent many years writing about um, in particular, African American Methodists in this country, and mm -hmm. um, it's impossible, right, to um, sort of write the history of um, evangelical Christianity, Protestantism, um, the Great Awakening, all of those themes without, um, in my view, accounting for black Americans. So um, mm -hmm. I think the way I come at your question is to um, ask myself then, um, how is it, right, that um, black Christians are wrestling with those kind of questions in their own, in the early period that you've described, mm -hmm. um, to then wonder what kind of continuities or carryovers there are. So that's the teacher's answer, so you'll forgive me, but I think it's a really important question, well, so yeah. thank you. I mean, I just add, uh, there's, n there's almost nothing more important in American history than religion. And too many secular academics ignore it. However, let's give Jefferson some credit one of the things the founders got right was separation of church and state. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, yes. Oh, I agree. And yeah. frankly, I don't think anything is freer in America than religious liberty. I'd have to add very briefly that Anglican supremacy is nothing like white supremacy. True. And we have to keep that in mind. What's incredible about the were... collapse of the establishment in yeah. Virginia is uh, the ways uh, in which Baptists and Methodists uh, adapted to the hegemonic planter culture, and they got right with the slaveholder's God. Just saying. All right. And our final question. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Chloe. I'm a student from Virginia Episcopal School. I'm an international student. I'm from Beijing, China. Um, I guess my question is more about democracy in the future around the world. So um, Francis Fukuyama predicted that um, the ideological like, evolution of like, polit political ideologies would end on like, liberal democracy. But the number of liberal democracies around the world is actually declining at this moment. So. I guess my question is, what's your prediction on democracy as we know it going forward? Do you think it's going to expand, it's going to stay the same, or it's going to like crumble and we're all going to end up in a miserable authoritarian regime? <laughs> I think we and don't forget the reception, everybody. <laughs> I didn't hear the last part. So democracy's dead, but the reception is on. <laughs> so, well. We're, we're in a, a, a populist moment, which is the way we like to distinguish the democracy we don't like from the democracy we do. And I think it's a, a warning to us, and it's a point that's come up at a couple times in our discussion. Uh, the democracy isn't an answer. Uh, democracy has the capacity, if the people will ex exploit that capacity, to make the world a better place. But it, just because we get to decide, you have to always ask the question, who are we? What do we know? Uh, what will we use our power for? Do we want to use it for anything beyond self-gratification? This is a dangerous moment because democracy serves many gods, and one is the god of therapy, of feeling good, of being happy that you can have fellow haters hate with you. <laughs> That's very true. 
So I, I, I'm, a, I'm a, a great admirer of Sherilyn Eiffel, who is um, today yeah. the head of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. And mm -hmm. Eiffel um, says, you know, we are actually profoundly young as a democracy. Right? She would mark democracy in the United States as commencing in 1954 with Brown versus Board of Education. Everything that came before that was something else in Eiffel's view. And that is um, both humbling, but I think also um, uh, sheds a light on our um, seeming incapacity or our seemingly, um, we have not yet mastered, right, what this might be. And Eiffel charges us with what she calls um, democracy maintenance, right? Is that if, if you believe in democracy, if democracy is what you want, um, you must work at it, right? You must find a way, um, whether it's in your work life or your civic life, in your um, religious community, um, wherever it is that we are all charged with doing that work in this very young and fragile democracy in a terribly fraught political moment of doing that work every day. I have no idea where we're going, um, but I only know we get there by virtue of what people in this room and in rooms like this all over the country um, do tomorrow morning, if not tonight, right, when you get home. Democracy's damned hard. Yes. Democracy's damned hard, and it actually runs against probably your nature. It means you have to give something up that the guy standing behind you has to have some of the same. Mm. It means you have to be taxed so that he has the same street to ride on that you ride on or maybe you support a public school. Democracy is very hard. It actually goes against our nature. And, and I also think, because it's so hard actually, that people begin to sort of shy away from doing politics as, as Martha has right. described. And then they start saying things like, well, I don't like politics or, or politics is not for me. And, and when I hear someone, saying politics is not for me, I hear someone saying power is not for me. Because mm -hmm. politics is fundamentally power. And, and so are we engaged as individuals in the struggle for power? Are we, are we essentially going to allow others to continue to lord over us? And so to me, to be, to do politics, to be involved in politics, to love politics, is to love power. Mm -hmm. And I think that in order for democracy to work, you have to have a collection of people who actually want power and want to share power simultaneously. And I think that's what we need in this country. And so I will say this, working toward democracy involves coming to conversations such as this. Not to be too much self-congratulation, but this isn't like entertainment. These are posing hard questions to ourselves. Now, I, for one, have learned so much from my fellow panelists tonight, and I'd like to thank them, and I look forward to seeing everybody upstairs. <laughs>